everyone. I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Publication Academy, where we're going to be discussing best practices when it comes to responding to peer reviewer comments on a manuscript that you've submitted, subsequently responding to so-called page proofs, and we'll be discussing that, and also how is it that you can conduct a high quality peer review if you're requested to do so by the editorial staff of a journal. So those are the three interlocking skill sets that we're going to be discussing today. Let's jump right in. So congratulations, you're almost done with the process of getting your paper published. You've prepared everything in the style that is compliant for your field. So if you're in something like APA, classic scientific research, what you're going to have done is submitted a manuscript with a cover page, an abstract, an intro, a methods, a results, a discussion section, and then in addition to that, an author note, references, and potentially appendices and supplements along with your tables and figures. We've discussed in prior modules how to be able to select the best journal, the journal with the best goodness of fit for your manuscript, how to be able to make that manuscript and all of its ancillary materials compliant with instructions for authors for that target journal. And now we're finally ready to be able to discuss the arguably final step of the submission process, which is how to be able to respond to peer reviews. So obviously the first thing that we need to discuss is how is it that you're going to receive these peer reviews? Who is going to send these to you? Are they going to send them in the mail? Are they going to send them in an email via one of these online portals, which we've discussed in prior modules? And so that's the first thing that I want to discuss with you today. So what's going to happen for the overwhelming majority of journals is that peer reviews are going to be delivered to you in an email. So what's going to happen is that usually this email is going to be received by whoever the corresponding author is on the study. This is an individual that you will have identified during the submission process. And you're going, that individual is going to receive an email, usually from the associate editor, if not an associate editor who's handling your peer review, then the editor in chief of the journal. And this email is going to either contain within the text body of the email, their feedback, as well as their preliminary editorial decision and the comments of several peer reviewers. So usually it ends up being between three to five peer reviewers. The higher the impact journal, in my experience over the last 15 years, the more peer reviewers you're going to have. In the rarest of cases, you'll only have two peer reviewers, but usually three to five is what you can anticipate. And it will essentially have all of their comments block by block, reviewer by reviewer. I'm gonna show you an exemplar of a real email like this. So it's either going to be all of that information information within the text body, or it could be the associate editor or whoever's writing you the email, their feedback and the preliminary editorial decision in the text body, and then an attachment, which will either be a PDF or a Word document that's going to have all of that itemized feedback. Or it could be something where within the email itself, it's going to give you a link as well as a reminder of your username and password for the online portal where you will have submitted your materials initially. And they're going to let you know that if you log back in, you're going to be able to download, again, a Word document or a PDF that has the preliminary decision as well as the specific feedback in terms of uh, what your peer reviewers would like to see changed, uh, provided that they haven't rejected the paper. So those are the three different formats that you're going to find. Now, I, I know the feeling, I, I've had this feeling uh, literally, what, 80, 90 times at this stage in terms of manuscripts with decisions coming back, where it almost feels like finding out whether or not you got into college or not. You're really kind of freaking out. You get an email, sometimes it says something like, you know, decision, and then the name of the journal, and then your, your manuscript number, and you know, your heart can beat so quickly, you can be so worried, and then you open it up, and then sometimes you're super excited, and sometimes, you you know, you, you just say, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, I'm so stressed out. It wasn't a positive outcome. So I definitely know how it can feel. But don't worry, we're going to go through together exactly how to be able to respond to these comments as well. 
But obviously the first thing is to be able to get that email, uh, never these days are you going to get peer review comments in the physical mails, like sent to you via post. Not gonna happen. It'll always be online in some format these days. So the first thing to do obviously is to download all of the comments, all the peer reviewer and editorial feedback, either from the attachment or from the portal. If it's something where all of the information is uh, not currently in a Microsoft Word document, my recommendation is to be able to copy and paste it into a new Microsoft Word document. And as we've discussed in prior modules, uh, it's very important to be able to, for the specific target journal that you're getting feedback from, have a subfolder somewhere associated with that manuscript on your computer. And essentially, that's where you would want to put this document that has all of that feedback. The first thing I want you to do is that once you have that new document that's got all the feedback is to be able to read it through just a simple once over and you're basically doing a very basic screen you're not reading it and saying okay I need to do this and this and this no I want you to read it through and screen it for four different dimensions okay uh, and to be able to give you a sense of the type of review that you got all right, so the first dimension is length. When you are taking a look at different peer reviewers, peer reviewers have different styles. Conducting a good peer review is just as much uh, of an art as it is a science. And I'm going to be showing you the technique that I have used over the last 15 years, uh, which editors in chief and associate editors have given me very positive feedback on, and has also resulted in my ability to be able to go from being an ad hoc reviewer for journals to being a full fledged editorial board member. And I ended up being an editor in chief of a journal in my field. So it's something where, uh, you will see a lot of different styles though, and some of these styles, and we're going to take a look at some examples of this in a moment, some people, their style is basically to type everything up in kind of massive block paragraphs. And it can be very difficult to be able to read through the paragraph and get a sense of, well, what is their exact feedback? Because what we're going to be discussing is how you should take feedback and break it up in an itemized fashion. So if you've got one big paragraph, what are let's say the four things in there that the peer reviewer actually wants us to change before we resubmit the manuscript for subsequent consideration. So sometimes they do that work for you, which is the best peer reviews, where literally they will either bullet out or number out their feedback for you. That is going to make your life so much easier. And in some cases, they literally will give you virtually no feedback or it will be so overly generic that there's really no way to respond to it. So if it's positive and maybe something like, uh, you know, this piece makes a genuine contribution to the literature, uh, we believe that it should be published, they may want to go through and take a look at, uh, you know, some sentences to see if they can add some more depth not very helpful. Uh, even worse is that sometimes they can be very, very negative and say something such as, this piece makes no con new contribution to the field. But they don't really say anything else. They don't actually dive into it. And that could be just as, uh, as unhelpful as something that's very, very positive, but also very generic in nature, all right? So the first thing we're going through to see is, you know, are we dealing with block paragraphs or are we dealing with kind of, you know, single sentence reviews, or are we dealing with super, super, super nitpicky itemized comments, which can take up sometimes multiple, multiple pages, but at the same time can be really helpful to you as the authorship team to kind of plow through them one at a time and address them and to be able to take care of them, all right? So that's the first dimension. The second dimension is, frankly, the temperament of the reviewer as expressed in their peer review. Sometimes individuals who, uh, we don't know what kind of a day they were having when they were looking at your paper. They could be having the best day ever, in which case when they were reading it, they were positively biased. Of course, this is implicit in nature. Or it could be something where they're having a terrible day and frankly, because they're kind of hiding behind the blinded peer review process, they can kind of just be a jerk to you and say whatever they want with virtually no consequences. 
And so because of that, when you're reading through though, you should get a sense of what is the tone, the emotional tone that's coming along with each of the peer reviews that you got. Are they kind of neutral? Are they quite positive? Are they in some cases very negative? That's very helpful to know before you start diving into the nitty gritty of taking a look at exactly what the peer reviewers are requesting for you. The third dimension that I want you to screen for is overall, are they supportive or not? You can have things that are written in a quite negative tone and then you look at their editorial decision, their recommendation, and it'll still be except with major revision and you'll say, I thought they hated me. Or it can be quite positive and then it'll be revised and resubmit. And you can really be scratching your head here and thinking, you know, wait, I really don't understand why it is that they would essentially conflate these two things. It just doesn't seem to make sense sometimes. So it is important, regardless of the temperament and the length, to just get a sense at the end of the day, what are they saying? Are they giving me a yay or a nay? Are they giving me an accept with minor revision or major revision? Or am I on the other side of the teeter-totter with a revise and resubmit or a reject? So make sure to be looking for that uh, editorial decision as well as the decision for each one of the peer reviewers, which usually is provided. And finally, what you want to screen for is the likely identity of the peer reviewer. Now, in previous modules on Publication Academy, we have discussed exactly how it is uh, that uh, essentially you should be selecting during the submission process your preferred versus your opposed reviewers. And preferred reviewers, of course, are individuals who are either on the editorial board that you believe have either the content knowledge or the methodological knowledge to make them really solid peer reviewers for your work. And we discussed in that module on submission exactly uh, how you should choose who you believe should be a preferred reviewer and how to recommend them in a cover letter to the editor-in-chief when you go through that submission process. But remember that just because you've recommended them does not mean that the editorial staff will have taken your recommendations. But it is wise, once you get a sense of what the uh, peer reviewer is actually requesting from you, sometimes you can get a sense of actually who it might have been, especially if that individual is someone who is already on the editorial board and you know their background in terms of their preferences, the approaches that they take, the theories uh, that uh, they are big proponents of. Sometimes you can get a sense of who that individual is and that can really help you be strategic when you are responding to their comments. But in some cases, it's a lot easier than that. And you would be surprised how often this happens. But in many cases, I have gotten peer review comments back. And one of the peer reviewers will say something like, you have actually missed citing some of the seminal work in your field, in the field that this manuscript is on. And you should cite it. You should be reading this work, etc." And oftentimes that work, which they'll usually provide you with the references of, they'll say, you know, take a look at th these three different works, uh, etc., or look at the work at Smith and colleagues, you know, published in this journal in this year. That is virtually always one of their publications. Academics, uh, as an academic, I, I say this, we are very egotistical sometimes and some folks more than others in terms of actually putting it out there. And so don't be surprised if you do see that. The way to be able to address a peer reviewer comment like that, and we'll talk about how to address different types of comments, but the way to be able to respond to a peer reviewer comment like that is to be able to agree with them, tell them that you appreciate them pointing out this truly seminal work and mention that you decided to cite it somewhere appropriate in the manuscript. It doesn't matter whether or not you think uh, their work is total, uh, totally you know, uh, unrelated to yours or not. Find a way to cite it. It's the easiest way to deal with the comment. The last thing you want to do is to say, we read the work, it's totally irrelevant, or we read the work and the, you know, the quality is garbage, whatever. Uh, and this goes back for a second round of peer review to that same peer reviewer they're going to be negatively biased uh, in terms of reading anything after they see that response to a comment that is about their work. All right, so find a way to be able to actually integrate that in somewhere in your piece.
Now, a few more comments here before I provide you with uh, some examples. I want to provide you first and foremost with an example of one of these emails that I got on one of my manuscripts. I've redacted it, of course, but you'll still see the, the verbiage, etc. And you will see examples of peer reviewer comments. And then I'm also going to share with you a few more materials that I think you're going to find quite helpful, or at least I, I hope so. I've developed some great templates for you as part of today's module that's going to save you uh, just so much time moving forward, both in terms of responding to peer reviewer comments and then down the line as well. Later in today's session, when we talk about how to conduct a peer review, I also have a template for you that is going to save you a huge amount of time when it comes to actually uh, responding to a call for you to conduct a peer review. All right, and we'll get to that. Uh, but first, what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at this, uh, you've just, you know, done the screening of all of that content that you've gotten in that email or that you've downloaded from the portal. So you've got all of that. Uh, and you would now have a sense in terms of those different dimensions, the length of the temperament and so forth. And now it comes time to really whittle down all of that text to just the meat right? Just the, just the things that you have to actually respond to. You need to also keep in mind that just because the wording that is used in, let's say, a paragraph or in kind of an itemized an itemized list of bullets or kind of a numbered list of comments that the peer, a given peer reviewer wants you to respond to, just because it's written in a certain way doesn't mean you need to copy and paste exactly what they wrote. Now, it should still be the same spirit and say the same thing, but what I mean here is that if there is something like an adjective or an adverb that is very rude, then it's something where you may simply want to omit that very rude word or paraphrase, paraphrase that very rude comment. So for example, uh, let's say that they want to talk about how uh, they believe that your sample size is too small. And let's say that the original comment is something such as, uh, the, uh, this poorly written manuscript has an exceedingly small sample size. Let's say that that's originally how it's written. Well, maybe the comment that you want to list is the study authors of this manuscript have a small sample. That could be it. That is how you paraphrase it. It's still the identical spirit of the comment, but you're leaving out the very rudely worded words in there that are frankly unnecessary because when you do respond to the comment, you need to be responding to the initial nature of the comment, okay? And if it's very negative, you should take that into consideration that the peer reviewer believed this to be something that is really a significant limitation, all right? But the issue that you want to avoid is when you return these peer reviews, uh, the responses to the peer reviews, to the editorial staff, the editorial staff is going to read each of the comments and your responses to them. And frankly, we want to not implicitly prime the editorial staff that looks at it in a negative way to view your piece in a negative light. And obviously, if it's something where that adjective or that adverb is, in, is important to be able to include, then I suppose you should include it, but I have never had a problem in terms of simply leaving out very rude adjectives or adverbs, provided that the paraphrasing that I provide is still the spirit of the initial compliment, of the original, uh, not compliment, <laughs> that'd be nice, of the original comment, all right? So the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to take the Microsoft Word template that I'm about to show you in just a moment as the exemplar, and you're going to go through and essentially take each piece of meat, as it were, for each one of the reviewers, and you're going to copy and paste it into that template. It's gonna be very easy, I'll show you, all right? And then one by one, you are going to respond to each and every comment, all right? Now, yes, you do have to have a response, to every single comment that is provided to you. And there are a few guidelines here. The first is you should always find a way to express gratitude in some way for constructive comments. Always either find a way to express gratitude or find a way to agree with what the, uh, the peer reviewer is saying to you. So if they say, you know, the sample size is too small, you can say something like, we agree with the uh, peer reviewer that 
it would be ideal to collect more data on this. And then you have to find a way always to address the comment in some constructive way. So for example, if they're giving you something and they're saying you need to collect more data, but you can't feasibly collect more data. You can't go back and collect another 100 participants. It'll take you years to do it. You should still find a way to be able to agree with them and say, you're right. It would be ideal to get more data. And because of that, in the limitations section, we've added that as a limitation. And as a proposed future direction, we have recommended the following, colon. And then you literally can say, you know, uh, you can have a quote that you have added, or not a quote, but you can have a couple of sentences that you have added in the limitations or future directions section. And you can literally just state in future studies, we recommend collecting uh, larger data sets on this particular topic to be able to cross validate or confirm our findings. And until that time, our findings should be considered preliminary. That is completely fair. Every study has limitations. And the magic phrase to use, if there's ever something where you just cannot address the comment, or they want you to do a whole new set of analyses that you just can't do, and you, there's nothing you could say in the manuscript. If that does happen, the magic phrase to use is, uh, we agree that it would blah, 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 unfortunately, or however, it is beyond the scope of the current study to explore that. So beyond the scope, is the magic phrase that you should integrate. And this is something that editorial boards usually really respect and they understand. If you can't find a way to be able to put it in the limitations section, ah, that's unfortunate. If you can, you should definitely find a way to put it in there. Why? Because peer reviewers always want something done about their comments. So if you go in and you rephrase something, you reword something, you add a sentence or two, you add a word or two, that is usually going to be enough for them. They just don't want a situation where you're refusing to take anything that they say on board. That is really a, a bad look, as they say. It's something that you don't want that to be the situation that you find yourself in, okay? Now, as I mentioned here in the third bullet point under responding to each comment, it's important to state precisely what and where you made a change. So for example, let's say that they're saying you need to include a statistical power analysis. You can say that we agree that this would strongly benefit the manuscript to have a sample size calculation based on power analysis. Hence, we've added to, let's say, the statistical analysis section uh, of the methods and then you can put in parentheses either a line number or you can say page 12 comma paragraph four the following colon and then you can add those sentences or you can just say that we've added the power analysis and then the page and the paragraph number so they know where to find it you do not want them hunting through looking through the manuscript trying to figure out where that power analysis is no you want to make life as easy as you possibly can for them all right and finally when you're writing your responses to the peer reviewers uh what you want to do is you want to take into consideration two things number one is that if you can figure out who the peer reviewer is most likely to be find out more about them especially their personality maybe you've met them in person or you have the opportunity to meet them in person at a networking event or a conference or for me, the easiest thing, go on to some sort of video website, go on to YouTube, go on to Vimeo and so forth. See if you can get some sort of a clip of them speaking. Maybe they have a podcast or a radio appearance that you can listen to their voice. You're gonna get a sense of, of their personality, whether or not they're very kind of stoic and a person of few words or, very, or whether they're very emotional, very bombastic. And you can use that to be able to get a sense of when you're responding to their comments, how much energy, quote, quote, should you put in? And obviously energy is hard to communicate in writing, but really what this has to do with is the use of things like, again, adjectives and adverbs. So for instance, if someone is very stoic, you can say something like, uh, this is an important limitation versus if the person is more emotive, you can say, we agree that this is a very important limitation to mention. And we sincerely thank the reviewer for this constructive comment 
it's something where you can just be a little bit more verbose and that's going to be an okay thing. In other words, if they're very warm, you can use those adjectives and adverbs versus if they're very stoic, you wanna be a little bit more blunt and different cultures internationally really fall more or less into one of those different camps. And that's fine. Uh, neither approach is right or wrong. It's just very different. Now, if you can figure out the personality of the peer reviewer, you should of course take into consideration the personality of the associate editor and the editor in chief and see whether or not you can use that information to be able to respond more effectively to the peer reviewer comments. All right, so now what I would like to do is to show you three exemplars to bring everything that we've just discussed into a practical light. So the first thing that I'm going to show you is, an, is a real email that I received concerning a preliminary editorial decision on a manuscript that I had submitted to a peer-reviewed journal. And it is from an editorial board member and it has all of the peer reviews within it. I'm going to show it to you. And it's really going to reveal the different types of peer reviewers that you may end up getting for your piece, all right? So that's number one. The second one is going to be this template that I've developed for you in terms of responding to peer reviewer comments. And the third is going to be an actual set of peer reviewer comments that I addressed. And in this way, you're going to see the actual verbiage that me and my team use in practice. And I can tell you that we have never zero times in 15 years have I ever had my peer review comments not accepted. So this is a tried and true set of templates and response styles. So let me go ahead, I'm gonna share my screen right now and I'm gonna show you each of those three documents. So the first exemplar we're going to be reviewing together is a file that's called exemplar email containing peer reviews. And sure enough, it is an email containing peer reviews. So let's go ahead and take a look. As you can see, the title of the email itself up here is the name of the journal, and then it has the dreaded words, decision on, and then the manuscript ID. This is gonna get your heart pounding when you get it. Now. Let's go ahead and read what it said. It says, Dear Dr. Singh, manuscript ID, then it gives it entitled, title of this particular article, which you submitted to the Journal of Aggression, Conflict and Peace Research has been reviewed. The comments of the reviewers are included at the bottom of this letter. The reviewers suggested some revisions to your manuscript. Therefore, I invite you to respond to the reviewers comments and revise your manuscript. Please attend to all comments. I would also invite you to present this as a preliminary study and to make this very clear owing to the depth of data that you have. Now, let me just have a little aside before I keep reading. This is important because that is the recommendation. That is the only feedback in this piece that I got from the editor and notice that this was a rare case where I actually heard back from the editor in chief as opposed to an associate editor of the journal. And so because the editor specifically said it as opposed to an associate editor, it makes it 10 times as important to make sure that you're actually addressing this in practice. All right. In other words, it was very important and we actually changed the title of the whole manuscript to have a colon after it and call it, I believe we called it either a preliminary study or a preliminary investigation. So we made it very clear even in the title of the manuscript as well as at several other places in the intro as well as the discussion sections of the piece that this was in fact a preliminary study just as the editor-in-chief wanted us to, okay? So let's keep reading. To revise your manuscript, log into, so they're using Manuscript Central here, which is pretty standard portal, and enter your author center where you will find your manuscript title listed under Manuscripts with Decisions. Under Actions, click on Create a Revision. Your manuscript number has been appended to denote a revision. All right, so what they're saying is that we're not going to email back revised versions of our manuscript materials. Instead, we're going to upload those again to Manuscript Central, i.e. the portal. Let's keep reading. 
You will be unable to make your revisions on the originally submitted version of the manuscript. Instead, revise your manuscript using a word processing program and save it on your computer. Please also highlight the changes to your manuscript within the document by using the Track Changes mode in Microsoft Word or by using bold or colored text. Once the revised manuscript is prepared, you can upload it and submit it through your author's uh, center. Now, I'll tell you as an aside here, it is not the norm to request that you use use track changes, let alone bolded or colored text to be able to say what you actually change. That's not normal, but it is normal for this journal, and that means that because it's our target journal, we need to do it. Let's keep reading. When submitting your revised manuscript, you will be able to respond to the comments made by the reviewers in the space provided. You can use this space to document any changes you make to the original manuscript. In order to expedite the processing of the revised manuscript, please be as specific as possible in your response to the reviewers. Now, as a quick note there, essentially when you are actually going to the portal and you are submitting your responses to the peer reviewer comments, one of two things is going to take place. Either they're going to allow you to upload a document, be it a PDF or a Microsoft Word file, where it has your itemized responses to each of the peer reviewer comments, or as is the case, as they've just said, for this journal, what needs to happen is that you have to copy and paste everything that you've just typed up in your Word document in terms of your itemized responses. You need to copy and then paste it into what's going to be a text entry box in the portal. And that's very important to know because what it means is that you should not add too much formatting, special formatting, to your file because otherwise it's just not going to show up when you copy and paste it. For example, if you end up centering something in your Microsoft Word document, it's not going to end up being centered when you copy and paste your information into that text box, that text entry box. So you should just know that. And you should also know that the template that I have built for you that I'll be showing you in a moment takes that into consideration such that if you simply copy and paste that template's text, into a text entry box, you're going to be fine. It's going to look great. And I've taken that into consideration when building that template for you. All right, so let's go ahead and keep reading here. Important, your original files are available to you when you upload your revised manuscript. Please delete any redundant files before completing the submission. In other words, what it's saying there is that when you are actually uploading the new version of, let's say, your manuscript or your cover page or your appendices and supplements, whatever that is, you're going to have to delete any previous versions because those are still going to show up when you're going through the resubmission process in the portal. That's what they're saying. And obviously, if you've been following our guidance here in our Publication Academy modules, you're going to know that you should already have backups of all of your documents on your computer already. Let's keep reading. Emerald, which is the publisher of this journal, has partnered with, with PeerWith to provide authors with expert editorial support, including language editing and translation, visuals and consulting. If your article was rejected or had revisions requested on the basis of the language or clarity of communication, you might benefit from a PeerWith's expert input. For a full list of PeerWith services, visit this URL. Please note that there's no obligation to use PeerWith and using the service does not guarantee publication. In other words, they're trying to sell you something, all right? And that is not odd for publishers. Once again, thank you for submitting your manuscript to the Journal of Aggression, Conflict, and Peace Research, and I look forward to your revision sincerely, and then the details of the editor. All right, now beginning here towards the end of page one of the PDF, it literally is just beginning with reviewer comments to the author, in other words, myself and my team. So here we go, reviewer one. What was their recommendation? Major revision. This is a cause for celebration. Major revision is great. Now you'll recall that there are five editorial outcomes, main editorial outcomes, which are except with no revision, except with minor revision, except with major revision, revise and resubmit and reject. And when I see major revision, that's essentially except with major revision. So this is very exciting. All right. So here are the comments. Now you'll notice that in this case, the peer reviewers provided me two different paragraphs. Now I'm going to allow you at any time you would like, I would encourage you to pause this video and either 
here in the video or because this document is going to be in your course materials simply open it up and read it on your device all right but i do recommend going through and reading this entire document so that you have a strong sense of the types of comments that you might get now one of the reasons i'll tell you now that of all of the manuscript decision emails that i've ever gotten i chose this one and it's because the three peer reviewers used very different styles in terms of responding to the call for peer reviews for my piece all right the style that the first peer reviewer took as you can see here is having a couple of generic paragraphs where they both highlighted what my study was about and then talked about the major findings they expressed gratitude at some stage in this case it's in the last sentence here as you can see the peer reviewer said thank you for the opportunity to review this manuscript always a good idea when you are submitting a peer review to express gratitude for the opportunity to read the piece and to have served as peer reviewer but then after that in a very helpful fashion the peer reviewer has itemized in a numbered fashion so one two three four five six seven eight each of their major comments and this is delightful because there's going to be a, a minimal amount of copying and pasting or paraphrasing that I'm going to need to do because they've really done us a huge favor here. Now what you'll notice is that after those initial comments, there is a section called additional questions. Now what this is, what this means is that the journal itself, and this is going to vary journal by journal, publisher by publisher, the journal specifically requested that when the peer reviewer submitted their peer review that they not only give their own individualized feedback uh, in any format they desire, but also that they respond to a few specific questions and these for this journal uh, has to do with questions about the originality of the manuscript relationship to the literature methodology results practicality and or research implications and the quality of the manuscripts communication overall and so because of that you will find that even though all three peer reviewers use very different strategies for their individualized styles of comment responses that all of them commented on these six different additional questions because that was requested by the journal here we go now we're jumping to reviewer number two you'll notice that reviewer number two used a completely different strategy their comments literally one massive paragraph all right and of course we would want to read through that and then essentially dissect it almost like we're a surgeon to be able to pull that meat out pull the marrow out and itemize that meat so that we can respond to each different itemized element separately and you'll also notice that relative to peer reviewer number one well, also, they gave the same recommendation, which is delightful of major revision. But look under additional questions. Whereas peer reviewer one only had a few sentences. Oh my goodness, we've got full paragraphs in this case from reviewer number two. And that's something that we need to be very appreciative of. But at the same time, we also, it's going to be a lot of extra work for us to go through and pull that meat out. Okay. Finally, we get to reviewer number three. Now, look at that. Recommendation, amazing. Major revision. Fantastic. Now, though, it says comments. Please see attached comments, which are kind of the big six uh, responses to the additional questions. But look at that. They literally didn't say anything. They have no individualized review whatsoever. Instead, all they did was respond to these six different additional questions. And they didn't respond to them nearly in depth uh, with the similarity as Peer Reviewer 2 did. So this just goes to show you how many different styles there are. But my big takeaways, because you saw literally what we just did are the first several steps of what I just recommended in this module of Publication Academy. Downloading everything, reviewing it, screening for things like the length. Uh, now the next thing we would do is kind of read through to get a sense of the temperament. We've already taken a look at the recommendation uh, in terms of whether or not they were supportive or not. And of course, when we do the in-depth uh, read through, we'll also want to take a look to be able to get a sense of of whether or not we can figure out who the peer reviewers are or not. So that's the first exemplar. Now let's go on to the next one.
So here we see the second exemplar, which is the peer review comment response template that I had mentioned earlier. This is the template where once you have pulled the meat out, once you have really distilled down what the individual comments are for each one of your peer reviewers, you can then copy and paste each one of those comments into this very useful template and then respond to them one at a time. The first thing you see up here on the screen is a general statement of thanks. And this is the statement of thanks that we're always going to have at the beginning of our peer review responses. Let's read it together. Thank you for the opportunity to respond to the excellent comments provided by reviewers. By addressing them, the manuscript has become significantly improved in the communication of its results as well as its overall readability. Now, a little sidebar here, obviously, if it wasn't a scientific manuscript, we wouldn't want to talk about results. Just a little sidebar. Let's keep reading. We have endeavored to address each of the reviewer's comments in an itemized fashion so as to streamline the editorial review process. Now, I have a line of hyphens. The reason that you're doing this is that if you have to copy and paste this entire document instead of being able to simply upload it as a PDF or as a Word document and attach it in the portal when you're resubmitting your pieces, if you have to copy and paste it, this is going to really be a nice way of separating out your sections. So in this case, what we're denoting is that Okay, now we're about to begin with the peer reviewer responses. So here we go, reviewer one, comment one, you would simply take that first piece of meat and you would paste it here. And then after that, you would respond to that comment. All right, then we would have comment two and the response, comment three and the response. Keep copying and pasting these down and renumbering additional comments until you've taken care of all of them for peer reviewer one. Then another line of hyphens, then begin with reviewer two and simply continue this simple process until you have taken care of every comment and every response for every review that you have received from the journal. So this template is going to be very useful to you. And finally, before we go back to the PowerPoint, what I would like you to do is to be able to take a look at a third exemplar with me. So let's take a look at that. So here we are. This third exemplar is a set of real peer reviewer comment responses to a manuscript that was accepted by a high impact peer review journal. What I would simply like you to do is to be able to read over each comment and then read over each response. And I want you to particularly keep in mind the strategies that we've been discussing in terms of always either thanking the reviewer and always coming up with a way to address something in every single comment response. In addition, take into consideration that we're always mentioning, because in this particular manuscript we didn't have line numbers, so we always mention when we did make a change, the page and paragraph it took place in, and in some cases where we added additional sentences, we would literally copy and paste those sentences that we added, and the way that we would kind of move this over is essentially by just Moving over here, let me go ahead and show you how we would we would do this. The tab here in the Microsoft Word document. Now, the reason why we're able to do this is because for this particular journal, we were able to upload this document as a PDF during resubmission. If you weren't able to do that, obviously we couldn't use that tab function. What we would do is simply put quotes around the new sentence and put it as part of the main response block, the main paragraph of the response to this particular comment, which is comment two. But of course, if you can use formatting, then it does really look quite nice to be able to remove the quotation marks and simply tab this over. It really makes it clear that this is something that we have added. So that is exemplar number three. I would like you to pause the video at this stage, have a read through. You will notice, oh my goodness, Jay, 15 pages. Are you serious of comments and responses? Well, again, I mean, take a look at this. This one reviewer literally gave us 27 comments. 27. Now, obviously, we're very lucky because 
this piece still managed to be able to get accepted after this first round of peer review, so that obviously was delightful. But simply writing this up, you know, this is a 6,000 plus word set of comment responses. So you should know that this usually is something that is going to take you quite a bit of time, you know, even a few days of full-time labor, depending on the manuscript and the extent of the comments, to be able to adequately address all the feedback that you have received. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump back to the PowerPoint. And what I want to do is finish here talking to you about best practices and responding to peer reviewer comments. So let's say on the manuscript that you're working on, it's not just you. You're not the only author on the manuscript. You're part of a team of different co-authors. If that's the case, you obviously need to give the opportunity for all of your study co-authors to be able to have a look at your peer reviewer comments, but also your drafted comment responses. If you are especially the first author, as well as the corresponding author, such that you would have gotten the feedback, and in some cases journals do send the peer reviewer comments, uh, to everyone who is listed as a co-author, but in the cases where it's only sent to one person, it is usually the corresponding author of the paper. So if you're the corresponding author, but not the first author, you should take everything, send it out to everybody, and have a conversation with the first author, because usually they're the ones who are going to kind of take these comments under their wing and take the first shot. They're going to be the first ones to be able to give it a try, responding to as many peer reviewer comments as possible. Now you saw in that one exemplar that I showed you 6,000 words. You may think to yourself, wait, they're supposed to do all of that by themselves? Well, here's the thing. Usually everyone on the manuscript took some kind of responsibility for a different part of the process. Some people wrote up the manuscript, some people conducted the data analyses. Some people handled, let's say, you know, ethics approval and a bunch of other things. Well, what the first author should do is go through, try to respond to as many of the comments as possible, but in a, any case, when they're reading through, that they see that there is a comment on something that they don't know how to address. Maybe it's something very statistical. For example, requesting that an analysis be rerun with one additional variable, but they didn't run the analysis. Fine, let's say the person who did run it is Dr. Smith. Then they would simply get in touch with Dr. Smith individually and say, here's this particular comment. We were hoping that you would be able to provide the response to it and let us know in the manuscript itself what, if anything, we should change. In other words, get that goodness of fit between uh, any comments as well as any tasks that were performed by individual study co-authors. What you should avoid doing is saying, let's say that there are 27 comments and three study authors. Okay, I'll take the first nine, you take the second nine, you take the third nine. No, I suppose that that is done in some circumstances. It is really the, the responsibility of the first author to be able to really do that work and be able to take a look through everything and give it the first go around, all right? But then do send it out to everyone. But when you send things out, do place a, a deadline and say, we need your feedback by, let's say, a week from now so seven days would actually be quite fair so we need any feedback from you if you want anything changed within seven days especially if you have sent them a particular comment that they in particular need to respond to don't be a jerk but make sure you know a very friendly follow-up a couple of days before that deadline if you haven't heard from them is not a bad idea people are busy you know how that is all right the second thing is that once you do get all of the comment responses, all of the feedback. If you're the first author, again, this is your baby. It is your responsibility to go through and decide whether or not that feedback is good enough. And if there are people who are conflicting in terms of their feedback, what they'd like to see is a comment response, you should either have an email thread. These days, I really think it's best to either have a, a group phone call uh, or a group video chat using some kind of technology, a WebEx, a Zoom, FaceTime, whatever you prefer, Google Hangouts, there's so many options these days but it is very important that you have a conversation about it uh, and if not you can always take the authoritarian approach and just say I'm the first author between these two I really prefer this one that's what I think in my judgment is best let's go ahead and 
go with that. So those are your different options there, but then you're gonna have that finalized version, a final draft of all of your reviewer comment responses, and then you're either going to upload that document, so let's say it's a Microsoft Word document or a PDF, where you have your responses, you're either going to upload it to an email as an attachment or via the portal, that resubmission process in the portal, or you're going to simply copy and paste it in an email response to the editor-in-chief or the associate editor who sent you the initial notification email with the preliminary decision. But regardless of, of uh, which way you want to do it, it doesn't really matter. They're going to tell you in that decision email how they want you to resubmit, all right? And just follow whatever they say. That's the most important thing. But even if you take, if you get no sleep for two days straight, you stay up for 48 hours and you grind it out and you respond to all the peer reviewer comments and you say, I want to resubmit as soon as possible. That is not a good idea. My recommendation is that you wait between one and a half to two weeks. So anywhere between, I would say 10 to 14 days, 10 to 15 days to be able to resubmit your materials. Why? Again, this is just a matter of bias. If I end up giving you let's say again 27 comments as the peer reviewer and that's only from one peer reviewer so let's say that you end up getting a total of 50 comments across three peer reviewers as well as the associate editor or the editor-in-chief if I give you all those comments and then what ends up happening is that I end up getting a response within two days I'm honestly going to think that there's no way you could have good, done a good job there's no way you could have adequately addressed this, even if you wanted to. It's not enough time. So if you do really do a phenomenal job and you get it done really quickly, sit on it and frankly reread it before you resubmit it. If it's been at least, you know, seven days since you initially read it, it's not a bad idea to go back through and double check your work, to be honest with you. And then upload everything and resubmit it. That is really the way to do it. And always, per usual, save a copy of your itemized responses. Put it in that subfolder that specifically has to do with that target journal for that manuscript. Now, when you're resubmitting, regardless of whether you're doing it via email or via portal, just like when you initially submitted and we discussed in the module on submission here in Publication Academy, how to write a formal cover letter to the editor in chief. What we wanna do here is actually do another cover letter, but this is a cover letter for the resubmission. And in terms of who we're going to actually send it to or title it to, so dear, well, dear who? Right, well, the person we're going to be writing to is whoever signed their name to that initial email where those peer reviewer comments were provided to you. This could be the editor in chief or one of the associate editors. Whoever that was, that's who you are going to title this to, all right? So, in this case, let's go ahead and read this together. It'll be, be Dear Doctor, whatever their last name is. And remember, it could be Mr., it could be Miss, it could be Doctor, it could be Professor. Make sure you're using the correct salutation, okay? Now, let's go ahead and read. Thank you for the opportunity to revise and resubmit our manuscript and then in quotes the title. And then in parentheses provide the manuscript number if one was assigned to your manuscript. We have thoroughly revised the manuscript in light of each of the reviewer's helpful comments. These changes have been comprehensive and we feel that they have greatly strengthened the piece. Please find attached an itemized response to each of the reviewer's comments as well as the revised manuscript materials. Thank you for your consideration and then all of your details, all right? Very simple. It is not like the cover letter for the initial submission where we have warrants and representations and a, a, you know, a brief summary of the piece, a brief overview of the piece. We don't need any of that for the resubmission. This should be very simple, but as you can tell, it is very simple and elegant and well-written, and it provides all of the materials that are necessary as well as, or all the info that's necessary, as well as expressions of gratitude, both for the peer reviewers as well as for the editor-in-chief for taking their time, frankly, to be able to go through this entire process with you.